All right, please raise your hand if you're in the Slido, if you intend to join it. And if anyone's having problems, please let us know. Hopefully no. All right. Okay, and we are one minute over, Brittany, already. Fantastic. All right, welcome everyone. Um, hopefully you've had an opportunity to join the Slido. Uh, there is a Q&A tab on that as well. So if you're not comfortable asking a question at the end, uh, feel free to stick it in there. Uh, we'll get to that at the very end. And then the other note that I want to make is we have a list of resources at the end of this presentation. So to the extent that you see something up here and you're like, oh my gosh, I need a picture of that because I want to take it back, don't worry. We have the resources already ready for you at the end with a QR code. So exciting. Uh, I love that listening and empathy are first on this list. Mm -hmm. Brittany, any notes? Safe communication. Safe communication. I think those are really good ones. Glad that, that we're getting some of that from you. Really cool that we're seeing okay to fail mm -hmm. over here. Love that. So welcome. You are at Key to Collaboration, How to Build Psychological Safety with Individuals and Teams. Uh, if this is not the session you want, you can run out those doors right there. My name is Brittany Aker. I am uh, the Senior Client Success Manager at Pounder.net. Uh, I lead the sales effort. I'm also part of the operations team. And uh, probably my favorite, most fulfilling part of my job is I also serve as a peer coach. And my name is Corey Nesland. I'm a program manager at Palantir.net. I've been there for about three years, just had my 30 year anniversary on Friday, go me. Uh, and I do serve a variety of clients, but my main role is to act as the coordinator for operations of our continuous delivery portfolio. Okay, so we're covering quite a bit today, but we're kind of trying to keep it to three themes. So that is, what is psychological safety and why is it important? How does having it or not having it affect your teams? And then what are some practices that can help us build it? And with that, we have a quick check. What is psychological safety? If you've just joined and you haven't uh, came into the room and you haven't joined Slido yet, we're gonna have this up here. There's a QR code. Feel free to come forward if you need to zoom in to get it. And uh, yeah, what is psychological safety? Is it gelato? Is it doing whatever you want? Is it your coworkers as therapists? These all seem likely, right? Give you like 10 more seconds to put your answer in there. I'm sure no one knows what the real answer is. It's not transparent at all. See a couple more people taking photos of the QR code. Brittany, do you have any thoughts about any of these answers? Which one would you pick? I like gelato. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with that one. Also, I wrote that one, so. <laughs> That's a mandatory laugh. Good job, guys. Good job. All right, so let's see, what is the answer? Oh, would you look at that? 4% uh, of you think it's gelato. I come Thank up, you. Yeah, come up later. <laughs> I'd really like to know what the undertone of that is. Like, what's, what's the palette? Of, a, of psychological safety as a gelato. Is it like lemony? I don't know. You guys let me know. Pistachio? Shocker. You guys are right. 96% of you. Psychological safety is the belief that a team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. Maybe that seems very obvious to you. You're like, okay, I know what it means to be safe for interpersonal risk taking. Maybe some of you are like, wow, that sounds really vague. Fair enough. Why should we care about psychological safety? Well, the term is not new. It's been around for about 35 years, and there's a ton of research on it. Um, you can see sources at the bottom. This has been looked at, it's been studied, but it hasn't been necessarily implemented into teams and practices on a wider level, right? So even though we've been aware of this as a concept for the last 30 years or so, uh, a lot of companies haven't been focusing on it. But if you do, you might see some of these results. Uh, the one that really comes out for me here is the 50% decrease in employee turnover, right? Just by a show of hands, how many people have been on a team where you can't seem to keep anybody and it's not maybe the <laughs> best experience? Okay, quite a few people are having that experience. I think uh, what really speaks to me, Corey touched on the fact that uh, it hasn't been incorporated very well into the business world. And it's usually because, and we'll probably mention this a couple of times, that companies often see these as separate endeavors. Um, what I love about these statistics here is you see just how interconnected they are. 
So you see how an increase in engagement with each other and with the, the places that we, we work uh, has a direct uh, result, or it directly correlates to an increase in our productivity. It directly um, has a, a shows an, it, I can't speak today. It has a direct impact in the way that we uh, have a connection with the work that we do and a connection with others. And then uh, as Corey said, as a byproduct, then we also see a uh, reduction in retention. So it very much benefits both us as individuals and also the businesses that we work for. Yeah, and you can see a lot of these outcomes are actually what D, E, I, and B efforts are trying to get at, right? So if you're saying, hey, this is a practice, we care about it, we're trying to improve our processes internally, you might want to think about, hey, are your teams safe? Like, can people work together successfully and collaborate and have um, differing opinions without it collapsing the whole uh, workflow? But what does it look like in real life, right? All of that's research, yes. We can see those stats and say, yeah, that looks good, but what does it look like in our actual teams? What does it look like in practice with a real team? So the next three slides I'm going to show you are from a team that I'm a part of uh, where we considerably increased our psychological safety over about three years very deliberately. Each slide itself kind of just gives you one snapshot of one thing, and you don't really see the full story or what we've done until you think about it collectively. Right, each one of these slides is just going to be a single snapshot. So, on the left in March, right, we are still at this time we're trying to be more psychologically safe, but we're still operating really siloed. We're having very different experiences of our working environment together. Uh, we're not necessarily collaborating very well, and so we have these like really wide margins of experience between people. But in October of 2023, we're a team now. The silos have been brought down. We're operating together even across projects and across clients. And our experiences are showing that we're now having the same kind of feeling about the work that we're doing. In June of 2023, we took the psychological safety survey, which we're going to talk about later. Don't worry. We have links for you. And in June, we're like, yeah, OK. you know." If we have to, we're okay taking risks and you know trying new things, whatever. But in December 2023, we're like, yeah, 100%. Cause now we have enough time, and you don't know this yet, but we've done enough experiments together where we're like, yeah, we can have new ideas, we can have discussions, and it's totally safe to do. We're totally fine with this. And then here's the big one. Our team velocity increased 237% in three years, right? Thank you. <laughs> now. This isn't, this team is largely the same group of people. We're taking the same work and we have not changed our estimation practices. So when I show you this, this is not manipulating the bottom or the top number by saying, you know what, we're gonna estimate things so that I can get more credit or we're gonna refuse to take hard work that takes time. We made no changes whatsoever to either of those processes. This also speaks to the what we, I was just talking about previously. There's a DEI writer and educator named Sierra Jones and she talks about how Team productivity exists and performance exists within an ecosystem of care and support. So it exists within psychological safety. So we as businesses have to stop thinking of those as separate things and we put them together because it's only with these things working uh, together that we see that leaders and teams are, are able to drive positive performance and positive outputs um, time and time again with their teams. Yeah. Over here in 2021, when we're first calculating this, this is the siloed group. This is, it's the same people, but we're not all working together. And by the time that we're in 2023, we are all working together with a shared set of goals towards a singular vision, and that's what's allowing this to happen. Or that, this is what's showing all of the work that we've put in over those two previous years. So, maybe you're asking, okay, great, what does an unsafe environment look like? So we talk about the factors that go into making an environment psychologically unsafe and how that negatively impacts the teams. There are tons of ways that we can see this show up. We have chosen to highlight some of the most common ones. So raise your hand if you've ever worked on a team where you did not feel safe to innovate or experiment. It was a culture of blame. There was high turnover. We've talked about that. It didn't feel safe to disagree with each other. You were missing diversity of thought. That again goes directly back to people not feeling safe to contribute. 
Um, what about delayed risk mitigation? Because we're too afraid to speak up about what that risk may be and be wrong, right? Um, and then there's just a lot of burnout, and we see that industry-wide. And then also, it's a huge bummer. It's a huge bummer. A huge all of bummer. This, all of this directly uh, kind of feeds into a decrease in employee engagement. All of these things become barriers, and it keeps breaking down um, our ability to fully connect and integrate with our teams. Um, next one. OK, so what about a safe one? What does that look like? What does that look like? Psychological safety, once established, is kind of like pushing a boulder off of a hill, right? Your team, in the very beginning when you're establishing it, you're all pushing, you're all trying to get it up this really steep hill. But once you get it there, once it starts going down, it's sort of self-fulfilling. You've already put in the momentum and it'll just keep moving. It's not like a discrete action, it's this mindset and practice that just keeps going over and over and over again. So as you approach new challenges, you're going to see that they're less difficult to deal with than they were before. So if you have high psychological safety, you're inherently more transparent. You're willing to be like, hey, I don't know, or I don't think that's a good idea, or I have this new idea, let's try it. And because you're transparent in your thoughts, you're fostering innovative ideas. You're coming up with new ways to work, new ways to, I don't know, improve your team health, et cetera. And because you're all sharing, you guys are gonna disagree. Uh, fun fact, who here thinks that, well, not fun fact, who here thinks that conflict is always bad? Oh, nice. Awesome. Trick. I'm sure you couldn't tell at all what the answer was from my tone. <laughs> You're correct. So constructive disagreement is a type of conflict, but it's a conflict that's not escalating. You're not having like a damaging relationship coming from the fact that you don't agree with uh, the person that you're working with. And because you're willing to have those open, transparent conversations that have constructive disagreement, you're gonna get to faster improvements. The, the innovative idea that came out in the beginning part now has multiple perspectives incorporated into it. And when you see that those things are successful, you're gonna lower the social stress, Lower social stress means that you increase more transparency of conversation, and here we go, right? We're back, back into this loop. So why is, it, why is developing it so hard? One of the reasons developing psychological safety is so difficult is because we are, our, our starting lines are all completely different, and we cannot assume the baseline or starting line of anybody else. So there are a million baseline contributing factors that um, are really complex and they powerfully impact the way that all of us navigate the world around us as well as, in this case, the way that we work on project teams and with one another. They can be things like age and education, family background, socioeconomic status, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, race. The list is really infinite. And as I read this list, I'm sure that we can all identify with them, but something that we should, con and something that we should consider is the way that they stack on each other to uh, kind of build a picture of who we are as people. But it doesn't stop there. These, it, there's just an infinite way that these mix and match to make us who we are. We could look exactly the same, but the way your blocks are stacked to create your person would be completely different than the way that mine are. Just like the hierarchy of that stacking could be completely different for me than uh, the way that the hierarchy of your stacking are. Uh, but what's important is that all of these interact in a way that brings diversity of our experience to our teams. Uh, acknowledging the, who we are and what we see in others brings uh, the value of diversity of thought and experience to the way that we approach projects. And it's just uh, a better way when we are understanding how we and others perceive and navigate the world around them. So this work is difficult. There are two parts to it. There's work that we do on ourselves, and then there's work that we do on a team. It's kind of a chicken and the, and, and the egg sort of situation. Both are extremely important. Um, and both need to happen. One may kick off the other, depending on who you are and what your lived experience is. Um, they can happen simultaneously, but uh, not without the other. So let's look at self-work. Uh, when we're looking at self-work, there are things that we, there are conversations that we need to have with ourselves, and a lot of it is about understanding who we are and uh, what our assumptions and our, and our internal biases are. So. No, you're good. So the things that we're doing are we're, challenge, we're challenging our own assumptions, our own internal biases, 
And that could, I, we say bias now and we automatically think of things like uh, race and, and gender, things like that. Yes, obviously, and what assumptions do we make about the fact that we're meeting people at the same level we're at? What uh, assumptions do we make about our shared or mutual understandings that need to be unlearned so that we can provide greater clarity and transparency in our communications? So what needs to be unlearned? Also, our empathy. Empathy is a muscle. Are we exercising it consistently and building it as needed? Self-reflection is so important and should be a constant. What is our awareness like of others and how does our lived experience impact the way that we are interacting with the people that we work with? Yeah, just to add to that, right? Like when we talk about challenging your assumptions and your biases, that can be a really like immediately like loaded sort of thing to say, to be like, oh my gosh, what are we talking about here? But a way to think about this is that we're filled with assumptions. That's all we basically do all the time is make assumptions and judgments. Uh, some of them are right and some of them are wrong. Have you ever, here's like another question, have you ever been maybe the least experienced person in a team and you have an idea but you're shot down because you're the first person to say something and everyone else is like, I'm more senior, I have more knowledge. Yeah, that's an assumption, right? All those senior people are making an assumption that because you're new, you don't have anything valuable to add. So there are other assumptions here than just like around those um, hexagons that we showed you earlier that need to be considered. What's so awesome about that example too is that the perception, the assumption could actually also go the other way. So you could be assuming that you're the least senior person in the, in the room. That may or may not be true. You could be assuming that the reason that leadership turned you down or people who are, have more history or work history in this situation turned you down is because you're, you're a junior. That may or may not be true. So all of these assumptions go into the way that we're interacting with the situation, and part of that self-work is breaking a lot of that down. Yeah. So as we do this self-work, we'll start to see these traits or these outcomes coming out from this. When we have more self-awareness, we're more willing to make space for others. We appreciate the differences in people rather than finding that to be a moment of conflict. We'll, we're willing to share privilege. And we'll start to lead by example, right? If you're trying to be open and transparent, other people will see you do that, and it will inspire the same thing in them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so the, the second part of the work we've talked about self is the, the work that the team is going to do together. So uh, we're gonna talk about some tools, some practices that you can do to make this work better and, and, and um, more, actionable, so it's nothing that's too, feels into, too insurmountable to take on for the team. And some of the things that we uh, want to build into the team is a safe to try culture of experimentation. We want to be using uh, consistent and honest retrospectives. We want to use liberating structures. That's a tool that we'll talk about a little bit later to help us foster clarity and communication. We also would like to um, encourage you to uh, do working agreements with your teams and uh, just put down clearly the ways that we're gonna work together and the agreements that we're gonna make so that we understand how we're navigating the space that we're creating. And then also uh, creating a, a culture of feedback and why that is a positive thing um, that positively affects the team that you're on and also the ecosystem or the system, the, the business overall that you're working within. And similarly to the self-work side, right? When we start to do this teamwork, we start to have the outcomes on the right, right? So things are more transparent. If we remember back to the psychological safety wheel, right? Transparency is huge there. Accountability, people say what they say they're going to do and what they do match up. You have a shared vision, shared goals. That's how you increase your productivity within your processes is when you're all focused on the same thing. Your decision making is more solid because now you're including more perspectives that are different from your own. So you're more trial and tested before it goes out into the universe. And we have re reduced tension. Again, part of that psychological safety wheel. So the, the goal of this teamwork is about finding ways that all of us can contribute to the baseline of psychological safety within our teams. And we have to remember that no one person can possibly be responsible for the psychological safety of everyone else. Uh, we can just do the work separately and together to chip away at these barriers that are standing in between us and uh, our goal. That's a really great point, right? If, if the teamwork, 
quote unquote teamwork is being substantially supported and completed by only one person, you do not have psychological safety. Mm -hmm. You have one person that's trying to get this ball moving and other people are not helping them push the rock up the hill, right? So we don't have it on here, but one of the things that Brittany and I are very well aware of is what's called the first follower principle, which is if you're the person who comes into the team, you're like, I wanna make this safer, I wanna do things differently, I wanna make this a more positive environment, you will get nowhere if you can't get at least one other person to buy in with you. The buy-in of that first person is what starts this mechanism. That person is saying, hey, I agree, let's try that. And that makes other people who are more on the fence be like, okay, sure. I'll join in. So self-work and teamwork, you have to have both to get to psychological safety, which comes first or which one you put more effort into first. And it's person dependent, it's team dependent, but you gotta have both sides, right? If you're not thinking about not having self-awareness, but you guys are doing working agreements, how much you wanna bet those working agreements are not good, <laughs> right? Because no one's thought about how they're contributing to the situation. So what's our starting point? Regardless of where you're starting, regardless of the level of psychological safety that your team has right now, we recommend you do these five things. First, you need to know your reasons. Why do you want to have psychological safety with your team and why do you personally think it's important? This is a really long process, right? If we go back to the velocity chart that I showed you, that was three years. And yes, we're increasing year over year, especially those first two years, but it takes time. And that's our second one. You have to accept that this takes time. You can't just go out and be like, Brittany, you will be psychologically safe with me. Do it right now. Done. <laughs> All right, that's less of a good example, but you get my point, right? Like, you can't just mandate that this happens. So third, start small. Pick something that seems manageable, that's probably an easy win for where your team is right now. Fourth, be transparent. So if you are the first person coming into your team saying, hey guys, I think I wanna try this or um, whatever, like tell them their, your reasons, tell them what you're doing. Say that maybe you don't know how it's gonna turn out, but you wanna try it anyway. And fifth, you gotta meet people where they're at. So many people in this room, you're at a different level of psychological safety within your team and an understanding of what this concept looks like and how to practice it, that's totally okay. Uh, except that other people are going to be less and more in it than you are at this point, and that's all right. So what are some tools we can use? I talked about this a bit before. You saw the pie chart. Uh, there's a psychological safety survey. It's very easy, I promise. It's seven questions. They're already written. Uh, Amy Edmondson wrote this, like I want to say, like 30 years ago, uh, and it's repeatable. So essentially, you ask this survey, and see where people are at, and maybe every six months-ish, you know, a couple of quarters, revisit it. See how your processes, the things that you did, have changed psychological safety for the better or for the worse, because it can actually go the other way, and that's okay. But it's important to know where people are at. Uh, we actually do this, and we do it about every six months. Team formation, user manuals, working agreements, and chartering have been really successful at helping our teams um, just create a foundation of uh, positive intent, agreements on how we're gonna work together so that we know how to navigate different things as they arise because we have planned for them. On the operations team, we used to struggle with analysis paralysis, with de decision paralysis. Uh, really great group of really smart people that could talk about a problem for a really long time, but we really struggled to get to resolution. Um, we acknowledged that that was something that we were struggling with. We took a step back, we worked on our user manuals, we worked on our working agreements, and we rechartered. I'm gonna be honest, we do not revisit it as much as we should, but setting the foundation alone made a massive change in the way that we were able to uh, interact with each other, navigate, the conflict that is inevitably going to come up when you're working so closely with others and has uh, just helped us be more productive and efficient with our time together. Yeah, we also do this. Um, and we revisit our working agreements again, not as frequently as we should. I know it's terrible. But uh, they have changed, actually, which I find really interesting. When my team did working agreements the first time, it, we had set a bunch of sort of like I wanna say like goals within them that weren't really realistic to how our team was gonna operate, but we didn't know that yet. 
right? We hadn't operated yet. And then once we did, we went back and we were like, we need to strike that. We need to get rid of it. It's not representative of what we actually do. And if we don't actually do it, it shouldn't be a working agreement, right? If you're not going to follow it, strike the rule. Otherwise, you're just creating nonsense um, that people know they can ignore. Okay, another show of hands. How many people have been at a retro where you talked and things were said, but absolutely nothing valuable was said? Okay, basically everyone. Um, we all know retrospectives, right? This is Drupal. We probably all do retros, uh, probably even quite regularly. Some of us do this every two weeks. But we still very regularly fall into this trap of like a retro that means nothing, that where nothing came out of it. One of the things that my team did that I really strongly recommend is to put in the team health radar. You saw that earlier. Um, by having this in every single retro when we meet every single month, I can see over years how different events changed the safety and the comfort and the happiness of the team. And it's the same scale. I make no changes to it. It's really important to have something that you can look at repeatedly and say, are we better now? Are we worse? What's the factor? And what can we do about it, if anything? Sometimes things will kind of be a bummer and there's nothing you can really do about it. It just is and that's okay. What you want though is the ability to say how do we reset? What is our baseline? Okay, blameless postmortems. I'm really curious. Who has actually done one of these? Oh, more people than I thought. Okay, cool. These are really tough. <laughs> All right, I recognize how tough this is. If you are operating in a team where as much as you'd love to be safe, you're not, and if you make a mistake, it's a problem, these are gonna be really hard to adopt. That being said, for us, this was a monumental shift in our, in our way of thinking and our mindset as a team. The second we started looking, Brittany, what was that thing that you said that was really great? Everything I say is really great. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I meant more specifically about this slide. I think it was something like it's us against the problem. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's totally, by the way, that's like a, a marriage thing, right? It's you, <laughs> it have, we spend, look, we spend a lot of time with our project teams, just like our spouses, and a lot of times that the, the point of view should be the same. It is us as a team against the problem versus us against each other. Yeah, and the reality is, is that mistakes are normal, they're inevitable. If you have a team culture that's like, darn you for making a mistake, that is very juvenile, right? We all make mistakes. Why don't instead we look at it and say, hey, how did we all contribute positively and maybe not so positively to this situation? And if it shows up again, how will we notice it's happening and how will we respond to it when that happens? This is a huge, valuable tool that I think many of our teams are not necessarily ready for right now. But if you can get into a point where you're willing to do this, I swear to God, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Strong recommend. Liberating structures are micro structures that foster collaboration and decision making inside of your team. So imagine having any problem that you face and being able to take a little flash card that is gonna tell you exactly how to navigate that and that is what liber Liberating Structures is. It's a big book, it's really thick. But there's also an app that we'll link in, our, in the resources um, and it just gives you a lot of ideas on how to do things. One, two, for all has been hugely successful for our company, particularly at all companies when we're trying to surface uh, the way people are thinking about something or the way that they are critiquing something because it allows you uh, to essentially start from a big group and then you go down to a smaller group and it surfaces like the themes. Very powerful. Um, uh, Wise Crowds is another one that allows you to uh, get input on maybe an experiment or a proposal that you've put forward. Um, circle discussions are a great way to make sure everyone's voice is heard, um, especially for some of us. You sure you don't want to hear from me every yeah. 30 seconds? <laughs> so this it's is a just, huge problem for me. Thank you, Corey, for being vulnerable in this space. Um, so it's just a great way to make sure that all of our voices are heard. There are a ton of liberating structures, an absolute uh, library of them that can be very helpful uh, for helping your team learn to better navigate and come out on the other side of communication with clarity and transparency. 
feedback practices. So another thing that we're working really hard to do at Palantir is to build in a culture of feedback and, and, and understanding that feedback is valuable. Uh, feedback is very difficult. We are all socialized from a very young age that feedback is negative. Um, and that negative criticism is very difficult. We shrink from it. And what we are trying to do is take some of that power back and know that we cannot grow without critique. Uh, we do not mean that there should be shaming. We've talked about that. That is not helpful. But we are talking about positive inputs so that our machines can keep running and improving over time. So uh, using nonviolent ways of communication, removing the blame from the feedback that you're giving, um, and then experiments. So something that we do is experimenting. Uh, we did a feedback lottery, which Corey will talk about in just a second. But also Corey and one of our other colleagues, Tanya, kicked off a feedback week last year with the goal of getting everyone comfortable with soliciting feedback. The result of that, though, was that they were soliciting feedback from someone else. So then those other people got to experience giving feedback uh, in, a, in a safe uh, environment. Yeah, and we have a, a project team at our company right now that's doing this thing called Feedback Lottery, where basically uh, they get randomly assigned, two people get randomly assigned to give each other feedback about the previous week. Um, and that has also, I believe, it's tough, right? Okay, I'm not going to argue like everybody's super happy about it and it's the best thing everybody's ever done, but it doesn't change the fact that like decreasing our discomfort with feedback is hugely valuable, even when it's uncomfortable, right? It's still a, a good idea. Um, and then the only other thing I would say on feedback is if you don't have a culture of feedback in place already, the best way to start one is to ask for feedback first. So I want to say like two and a half years ago, I started asking my entire team, literally everyone I work with for feedback every six months. And I was like, yeah, cool, whatever. Just let me know. Uh, and it, A is it, it was super valuable for me, right? Because it helped me see some of my blind spots, but it also taught everyone that I was being very intentional about how I was showing up for the team. And then if the way I was showing up wasn't helpful, they can tell me about that and it's okay. All right. So consent-based decision-making. Has anyone here ever done consent-based decision-making or know what it is as a decision model? All right, a couple people. So consent is trying to get us away from the default, which is often consensus or authoritarianism. So the authoritarian part, consent requires that person to step out and say, hey, I'm gonna move the decision to more people. But if what you're more likely to have is consensus, which is very normal, Consent is trying to get the blockers out of the way. If you use consent-based decision-making, essentially what you're saying is, you can't just say no, I don't like it, it tough cookies. You, you don't do that. What you say is, well, if it's safe, as in it's not going to damage anything, the scope is limited, we can reverse it if it doesn't work, as long as it's, it fits within that, you can't say no. You disliking it or wanting to have an alternative should not be a blocker for the people who want to solve the problem and try it. So with this model, it's very specific. Um, we have the resource listed at the end so you can figure out how to do the process. Full transparency, I think when we first started doing it, our decisions took like an hour and a half. But now we can do a consent-based decision in two minutes or less. So the more that you practice it, you kind of get into like what's in, it's, what is it intended to do and then how do you shorten that? Once everyone knows the process, then you have less like back and forth of like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, do I ask a question now or later? You'll get over that. Um, but it does have a high lift in cons uh, for time in the very beginning. And that is actually what fuels our experimentation. So in my team, we are very intentional about experimentation. Uh, you don't have to be this intentional, but we actually have a report template where basically we help people think through what the problem is and what their hypothesis is and whether or not that supports their proposal. And then once they fill this out, they bring it to the team and the team gets to go like, I have questions here. I don't know about this one. Like, did you consider X, Y, and Z? And that facilitates this whole experimentation process. We have uh, different statuses, so once the experiment is in progress, it'll switch to in progress, and when it's completed, we'll write up what the results were with a little blurb. It's not like, oh, here, let me spend three hours writing it. It's more like, if we encounter this problem again in the future, did this experiment work? What were the factors involved, and should we try it again in this new situation? So this becomes leverageable by other teams. We can also keep in mind that experimentation can happen at any level of the organization. So even if we are trying to implement 
experimentation in things that just we are involved in. So I'm a team of one, many of you may also be team of one, team of two, but there are things in our day to day that really don't impact anyone at all. And we can also bring a spirit of experimentation to those things. So if I am leading an initiative and I decide to try a new format of my spreadsheet, do I need to go and get consensus? Not necessarily, but I can choose just like a team would, to implement a change, track how, whether it works or it doesn't, and then move accordingly at the end of that. What's so great about um, working in a culture, in an environment where there's a culture of experimentation, is that nothing becomes overly precious. If it is safe to try, it's also safe to let go. So we can try things and get it out of there. And as we know in Agile, things are just, it's about iterative improvement, and that's what experimentation is about. What can we make 15% better? And how many times can we do that? And things just get better and better over time. It works, I promise. We did it. It works. All right, so what's your game plan? You're bought in, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm down. Well, your, your starting place, place is probably going to be dependent on what level of experience your team has theoretically with this concept. And I don't mean that they know what that term means, but like in their behavior, are they psychologically safe or not? So let's say you just want to get started. You don't know what your level of psychological safety is. You're not sure. It's like brand new. Here are four really easy ways to get the ball rolling that are aimed at trying to increase literacy. So the first thing you need to do is you need to make sure that we're all understanding this concept roughly on the same level so we can have a conversation about it. If you don't know the words to have a conversation about this, you can't participate. You're, you can't like understand what we're trying to do. So you can start a book club. We have a lot of books in our resource list for you. Uh, design a really small experiment, pr preferably something that you think you can succeed at, like nail it the first time. Start asking for feedback, as in solicit it for yourself, and then do user manuals. Find out who's on your team, what they care about, what their growth goals are, et cetera. If you're a little further along in your journey, maybe you've done some of the things on the previous slide, or maybe you know that there's already a baseline understanding of psychological safety and a desire to move towards that with your team, Here's some other ideas. We can run the psychological safety survey. That'll be in your resources. Um, and that'll be a really great way to see where your baseline is. And then our suggestion would be to run that every six months so that you can track that over time. Use liberating structures. Those are the tools that we just talked about, the microstructures that can help you and your team work together with more clarity. You can establish uh, or revisit your working agreements that you did before. And also, you can move decisions to uh, safe to make decisions to consent based decision making. Yeah, these are all tools to help you get that wheel really moving quickly. All right, so what if you have high psychological safety? Well, rerun the psychological sur safety survey. Just because you think you're nailing it doesn't mean you are. Double check that. Um, start tying your experiments to findings from your ceremonies, particularly blameless postmortems and retros, if your retro has an improvement component to it, as in how could we improve or what would be an improvement goal. And then the last one is the big one. What's the point of having psychological safety if you can't have the conversation that needs to be had? If you can't say, hey, here's the real problem, or here's the real issue we gotta work through, there's no point to this. So you've spent the time to build it, it took you time, have the conversation that needs to be had. That's the point. All right. So together today, we have defined psychological safety and its impact on the team and the team's ability to collaborate. We've described the self and teamwork involved in building it. We've reviewed tools that are available to us all that can help us on this journey. And then we, lastly, we suggested some action items that you can take with you to get this ball rolling. All right, so if you were using Slido, and some of you were, uh, you can put in your questions. We're also gonna just do hand raising. So if you guys are fine raising your hand, you can do that as well. Um, all right, what does psychological safety look like in a multi-generational team? Ooh, that's a great question. That's a great question. I don't think. Did you have an answer for that question? You damn idea. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. <laughs> Not assuming how old somebody is. Not assuming how old somebody is. That's very good. Try it. I also think that. Um, thank you. And yes, and uh, there's also a lot of assumptions between generations about uh, the way that we interact with each other, about our desire to to work or not work. Um, so a lot of that is that self-work that we need to start unpacking. Those are assumptions that either we created or were given to us that we need to do the work to unlearn. I think the big thing that also comes to me with this question is 
there's no, I can't define this. I have no idea who's on your team. I'm not part of it. I have no clue. It, it is all teams are not going to look the same, even if they're psychologically safe. The, if this team, if this table was a team and that table was a team and both were completely psychologically safe with each other, it would still not look the same, right? The people on that team are different. Psychological safety looks like what it's defined as. It's safe for interpersonal risk taking. It means that every person in that team is comfortable having tough conversations and working towards a solution without a breakdown in the personal relationships. Psychological safety also places a premium on differences, the value of different differences. Um, when you have a, a, an environment that is psychologically safe, you're viewing uh, people and their independent worldviews as pieces of your puzzle. And as we know, when our puzzle pieces fit. And so the fact that we're of different generations do not matter. We both bring uh, pieces of the puzzle that make us, us work together and, and fit together. If this person is struggling in a team dynamic where they feel like, and I, and I don't know, where they, they feel like they're being viewed differently because of multi-generational um, issue, I would probably go through the steps to build psychologically, a psychologically safe environment with the team as a whole. When you get to a certain place where you start feeling safe enough to challenge the status quo, and that's one of the steps in building a psychologically, psychologically safe environment, then you can, as Corey said in the last slide, have the conversation that needs to be had. If through your efforts as a team uh, to become more psychologically safe, if this is still an issue, then what we are working towards is getting to a point where you can have a conversation with that person and say, hey, I'm feeling this way. I have some assumptions about why, but I just like to talk about it. Because your assumptions could be wrong. Your feelings are not, but your assumptions can be. And so getting to the point where we can have a safe and productive conversation is the goal. Brittany, do you want to, if you hover over that question, it should show you a little circle that says resolved, the check mark, so we can see the others. Okay, next one is team velocity. I can go really quick on that. It's basically a, a measure of output of work by hours worked. So if you think about one hour, if you had a velocity of one, it means that you have one unit of work per hour. Um, that is unreasonable, just FYI. <laughs> like a one to one is not accurate, um, and it's never if you have that, you need to check your estimation processes or something because you're, you're messing with that number. You can't have a one-to-one -one in also, reality. Also, for the sake of this conversation, if you, think about, um, if you think about it like your team is riding a bike, velocity is like how quickly you can go, and everything that we've talked about today, they're like speed bumps. So the goal of psychological safety is to get the speed bumps out of the way so that you can, you can move uh, more smoothly. And as those bumps get out of the way as the cracks in the pavement are filled, the smoother your terrain gets. Just, just think about riding a bike and how, how you can be faster and, and more efficient at that. Yeah. All right. How do you solicit feedback in a group one-on-one -on -one using a form? There is a whole, there's 20 hours of conversation on this topic. Um, I actually speak on this. There's a presentation in the resources that I would recommend going in and, and looking at. Um, the best way to start is one-on-one -on -one and in person if you can do it. If you're not comfortable with in-person one-on-one feedback, you can use a form. The downside of that is that most people don't feel psychologically safe putting their answers into a form because they don't know how it's going to be perceived by the other person. So yes, you can do that. It's not a good place to start unless you're really, cons really nervous about the process. And if that's the case, that's okay. But try and move to the one-on-one. -on -one. And I often think start small. Um, Ask someone that you feel relatively safe with and work closely with to give you feedback. Time box it. Hey, Yuri, can I have 15 minutes of your time to solicit feedback? If you feel like it would make you or them more comfortable, send the questions that you're going to ask ahead of time. And that way, there's just a very low, low barrier to, to entry. Brittany, you want to do the next one? How can I remove barriers to other psychological safety based on assumptions they make about me? <laughs> it, uh, have we met whoever wrote this, <laughs> whoever wrote this question? Uh, be as transparent as possible. Um, I am a very blunt speaker, as my friends and colleagues can speak to, and often people are not raised that way, right? So they view my, my bluntness as something else. I don't want to use aggressive because we hate that word, but as aggression, they may... Uh, perceive my mood to be something that's completely not. So often when I go into a space, I introduce myself and I say, hey, I just say the thing. And no matter what you think my tone is, 
whatever you think my mood may be, that's not it. But I work very hard so that the words I'm saying are what I mean. When in doubt, trust the words that I'm, when I'm, that I'm saying. If you're still in doubt, ask me. I know myself. I do the self-work. And I would be happy to clarify at any time. Um, when you go in, and I do not make apologies for who I am, right? I love who I am. But I do understand that we're very different people that, that have to navigate space together. And so I make space for you to feel safe to, to come and challenge me. Do you follow? Yeah, I'm big, loud, stubborn, and I cuss a lot. So I absolutely am right there with you. Yeah, it resonates. Awesome. Um, and the only other, oops, that was the wrong Sorry. one. They changed order. Um, but I will say that the other side is, is you cannot change how, s you, you can't force someone to think about you differently. Um, that's not possible. That's not within your power to do. Uh, so just keep that in mind. This process of doing this as a team and the self-awareness that comes from doing the self side of the work will allow you to recognize that and will allow the team to incorporate it. But you cannot force anyone to, um, to do this. I'm sorry I deleted someone's question. Did you see it before I deleted it? I think it had to do with feedback, which is a little bit outside of the scope, so I was going to skip it, but um, we can come back. You can come talk to us at the end because we have a lot of practice around feedback, um, but that t question was really in the weeds, so let's come back to it outside of the presentation. Um, how can I remove barriers to other cycle? Oh, no, that's the one that we were trying to click. All right, how do you continually reestablish psychological safety when a team has an annual turnover rate of 50%? That's really high. Um, I, I would challenge the assumption that you have psychological safety to begin with, um, right? Because if you have this kind of turnover, that's probably a really good business indicator that there's something up with the team that's not good. That could be coming from, yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Oh. I see. I see. Then my recommendation to you would be to create practices that live regardless of what, who is on the team. So if you are a member of the team who's consistently there, you can set up um, sort of like working agreements of if you're in this team, we do things X way. Uh, those can change when you have new people. But if you already have like um, good practices as your baseline, then when someone new comes in, you introduce them to those base practices and it will, they can join in at their capability level. They may not be able to. It, it depends on what your working agreements are. Oh yeah, I skipped it because it didn't say psychological safety, but that's okay. You can just hit the check mark. Which one do you want to do, Brittany? I want whoever did the top question to come talk, chat with me after. I think it's a bit of field of what we're talking about, but I'd love to hear more. Okay, the next one, language like psychological safety has triggered folks to trauma dump and use victim language. How do you open the door without opening a floodgate? Psychological safety is not therapy. So this is not like you become the therapist of your coworkers. That's why it was a joke answer in the poll. <laughs> that is objectively what you don't wanna have. Um, I think if you're having this experience with a person and maybe Brittany, you have some ideas as well, this might be a good cue to you to try and establish a different relationship with that person individually. Like talk to them about, from a professional standpoint, like what is coming up for them? Like what about the way that your environment is operating is causing this sort of reaction? Um, but I would absolutely say like if, if the person can't separate the personal and the professional, that's also not on you to resolve, right? Psychological safety is not about resolving all the blockers for individuals. People have to participate and buy in to this idea. A place like this would be a really good uh, start to maybe introduce nonviolent communication is one of the thoughts I had. Another thought I had is um, part of doing the self work is also building up our ability to advocate for our needs and build our boundaries. And if what we have is someone that is consistently crossing those boundaries by treating us in a way that is uh, not okay for the professional setting, like trauma dumping on us, then it's time to reassert those boundaries. I acknowledge that that is not easy. I acknowledge that someone who is doing this, this is not okay behavior, I think we can all agree. Um, they may not receive that well, but we can't get anywhere if we don't start rebuilding that boundary so that we have somewhere to 
to, to meet that person in a difficult conversation. It looks like our time is up. It is. So if you have, if you want to continue talking about this, we're here. Please come talk to us either now after the session or at the Palantir.net booth. We'll both be there. But we promised a list of resources. Here it is. If you want to grab it with the QR code, there is a short survey on there. It's just four questions. Um, we're just asking for some feedback. Yay, feedback um, on how this was for you and if there are any improvements we could make. Um, you guys asked some really great questions. Thank you yeah. so much for participating. Yes, it is. Thank you so much, everyone.